people, this is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome, everybody, to Mitchell's Presbyterian Church. I'm Reverend Michael Klang, the Covenant Pastor here at Mitchell's, and I'm just so glad that you have tuned in to worship with us on this sixth Sunday after Pentecost. It's a beautiful day, and we're just glad that you are here with us, and however you uh, have tuned in and wherever you may be this day, my hope and prayer is that this 30 minutes or so that we spend together in virtual worship will be very, very meaningful to you. So once again, welcome. We're glad you're here. Uh, I wanted to make sure and remind everybody in the Mitchell's congregation that the deadline for getting your pastor nominating surveys completed is fast approaching. So if you have completed yours and turned yours in, thank you. If not, this is your encouragement to hurry up and get it done. It's due this week, so thank you. I know that several of us are going to be traveling this week, and many are watching this, uh, maybe from away or have some upcoming trips coming. So I wanted to share a blessing from our book of uh, book of worship on travel. So. Hear these words. The world is yours, mighty God, and all people live by your faithfulness. Watch over those who are traveling. May they be careful, but not afraid, and safely reach their destinations. Wherever we wander in your spacious world, teach us that we never journey beyond your loving care, revealed in Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. So united together as one, wherever we may be this day, let us now call ourselves to worship. As Abraham welcomed the strangers, God welcomes us. God greets us with joy and says, rest here for a while. God brings out water to wash our dusty feet. God prepares a meal to nourish our weary spirits. Let us receive the gracious hospitality of our God. Let us rest in this holy place where there is shade, water, food, and laughter. Let us now go inside to continue our worship of God. Come. With humble and trusting hearts, let us confess our sin before God. Let us pray. We confess, O oh God, how difficult it is to be still. And once we are still, we confess how difficult it is to listen. And once we listen, we confess how difficult it is to follow. Forgive us our restlessness, our failure to listen to your call, and our resistance for going where you are sending us. Grant us another chance. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone. Behold, the new has come. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, as the scriptures are read and the gospel proclaimed, open our ears to hear your word, open our eyes to see your truth, and open our hearts to receive your grace. Amen. Well, our first lesson today comes to us from Genesis. We're reading chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. Hear these words afresh and anew on this day. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre, as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you,
Do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring you a little bread, that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. <clears throat> so they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened to the tent to Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it, and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf tender and good and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree while they ate. And our second reading comes to us from Luke's Gospel. We're reading chapters 10, 38 through 42. Jesus and his disciples are traveling, so. Now as they went on their way, he entered a certain village, where a woman named Martha welcomed them into her home. She had a sister named Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. Friends, the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Join me once again in prayer. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock, our strength, and our redeemer. Amen. So a couple of weeks ago, we spent some time talking about the importance of being still. We saw how Elijah heard God's voice, not in the whirlwind, but rather in the silence. We remember the words of the psalmist who told us to be still and know that I am God. And I challenge everyone to find some time just to be quiet, either sitting in prayer or meditation or on a walk. Time spent alone and in silence to still our busy minds. Then we talked about how dangerous this could be, how God can entice us or inspire us to action. We looked at the prophet Jeremiah who got frustrated with God for inspiring him because every time he acted and did what God inspired him to do, the people around him were just mean to him. We talked about how important it is to say what you need to say, even when you might be scared about the action or reaction you will receive. Contemplation and action, not opposites. Not on one side of the coin and one on the other side, but rather on both sides of the same coin, working in balance with each other. But what happens when they are out of balance? What if there is too much doing? Can that even be a thing? Well, we're going to look at this today through the lens of hospitality. Now, I'm sure if we were in person gathered together right now, and I went around the room, everyone would give a definition of hospitality. Maybe not a dictionary definition, but an experience of what defines it. I'm sure most of you all are familiar with the comedy show, The Big Bang. But for those who are not, on this show, one of the main characters whose name is Sheldon is this nerdy science guy that has all these smarts, but what he has in brains he seems to lack in social etiquette, which is part of what makes the show so funny. Well, one of the things he is taught early on by his friends is that whenever guests come over to their apartment, it's appropriate, or let's say, hospitable, to offer a warm beverage. Now this was new to me, I never grew up with that tradition, but I actually learned it firsthand from a refugee family. 
couple years ago, Tracy and I and her sister had volunteered to help a refugee family from Syria, a family that had left their home when it had been destroyed and after a brief time in Jordan had resettled to Richmond. And I will never forget the first time coming to their apartment after they had had a day or maybe two to settle in. They sat us down on the couch and offered us warm tea and dates. And this was just not to say thanks for helping us. This happened every time we came to their apartment. You would just go over quickly to pass off some information or maybe to pick them up for a doctor's appointment. And it was, sit down, sit down. And one would come out with tea and dates. Hospitality. And Tracy and I have seen a lot of that here with you all. Coming here for the first time as a supply pastor back in September, I was blown away by your genuine kindness. And it's not just to me because I was your pastor. I see you do it with everyone. You are bathing people in hospitality. Well, one of the dictionary de definitions of hospitality is the reception of or yeah, the reception of guests or strangers without reward. Well, we see this in our Abraham story that we just read. Abraham is just taking it easy outside of his tent during the heat of the day when he looks up and sees these three, three strangers. His response seems appropriate at first, but then he takes it to a whole nother level. I mean, at first, it's simply good, basic hospitality. Sit here for a while. Let us wash your feet while you have a little water and bread. And then be on your way. But then, whoa. He breaks out not just any flour, but the bread for the, or the finest flour for the bread. He instructs his servants not just to prepare any meat, but rather to prepare the choice calf for the guests. I can remember one time, Tracy and I were staying at a, at a hotel in a small town that was right next to the Appalachian Trail. It was not the season for trekking, so we had this whole dormitory room to ourselves, which was both awesome and a little bit creepy. But it was cheap, and it came with this full breakfast. So in the morning, I was expecting some cold cereal, or maybe a muffin or two. No, these folks were used to feeding hikers every morning. We had eggs, pancakes, waffles, muffins, toast, bacon, sausage, fruits, orange, and apple juice, and all the coffee we could drink. It was crazy. I mean, we could barely move after that. Well, Abraham seems to be doing the same thing with his select flour and prime cuts of meat. It's a bit over the top, which raises the question, can hospitality go too far? Can we offer so much service that we forget why we're doing it in the first place? In our Luke reading, Jesus and his disciples are on their long journey to Jerusalem when they do a stopover at Mary and Martha's house. Now, I'm sure word had traveled ahead of time that they would be stopping over, and I can imagine the conversation between Mary and Martha might have gone something like this. Okay, Mary, Jesus, the disciples, and several other guests will be here in two days. Let's head to the market and get the ingredients for some of our best recipes. We'll get our uncle to slaughter the best lamb. We'll have hummus, beans, lamb kebabs. I can imagine if the scene took place today, she might Google chickpeas, grape leaves, and olives and have a dozen different recipes of how to prepare them. Well, on the day of their arrival, I'm sure there was plenty of last-minute cleaning and scrubbing and table setting. And as the travelers got to the house, we read Martha says, or we read that Martha welcomes Jesus into her home. But then an interesting thing happens. Mary stays out of the kitchen. Instead of helping her sister with the final cutting and chopping and boiling and serving, she is sitting at the feet of Jesus. She stayed out and listen to Jesus talk with the other disciples and guests while Martha juggled everything in the kitchen. Martha's not too happy. At this point, I think she started to do a little banging on the pots and pans. I can't believe this. What is she doing? 
And I'm sure Jesus and the disciples heard it and just kept on talking. Finally, Martha's had enough and she goes out to speak to Jesus. Master, don't you care that my sister has abandoned the kitchen to me? Tell her to lend me a hand. The wise Jesus was not sucked into the dispute. Hear his response from the message translation. Martha, dear Martha, you're fussing far too much and getting yourself worked up over nothing. One thing only is essential, and Mary has chosen it. It's the main course and won't be taken from her. Well, honestly, if I were in Martha's shoes, I'm not sure how I would have taken that. I think I might have stormed back into the kitchen, thrown the serving towel to someone else, and just said, that's it, they can feed themselves. We don't get to hear the, the rest of the story. And over the centuries, Bible scholars and theologians have agreed and disagreed on what to make of this story. Many have said that it's a critique against busyness and that we should all be less like Martha and more spiritual like Mary, sitting at the feet of Jesus. But is Jesus really criticizing Martha for her busyness? Hear these words again. Martha, you are worried and distracted about many things. Literally, she is distracted by much serving. Jesus was not criticizing Martha for her service, for her genuine hospitality. He was simply reminding her that she needed to be present in the act of serving. She was so caught up in making everything turn out exactly right she seemed to forget why she was doing the meal in the first place. She lost sight of what was right in front of her. And that was Jesus. Are we guilty of that? I know I can be. I can get so caught up in what I'm doing, so focused on getting everything perfect, that I can miss what's going on around me. I can miss seeing Christ in other people. Tracy will say, did you see so-and-so today? They look really sad. And I'll be like, no, I miss that. And I'm sure Martha would tell us, being present with what you're doing, it's hard work. I'm sure right now a lot of you are starting to tune out my voice and starting to think of all the things you're going to do once this video is finished. It's just how our minds operate. Practitioners of mindfulness will talk about Focusing your energy on one task at a time, like doing the dishes, is a way to practice being present in the moment. As you do dishes, you feel the water on your hands and the soap as it covers the sponge and as the sponge goes over the dish. And all other distractions go away. It's a way to focus on just doing one thing. Which is exactly what Jesus is telling Martha. What is the one thing you need? to be present in your serving so you don't miss seeing me? That is his challenge. Jesus was not trying to put Mary and Martha against each other as if we must make a choice, contemplation, or action. As so we've talked about, we need both, but they have to stay balanced. Too much contemplation and we're just sitting around doing nothing. Too much action and we end up like Martha. Distracted by our busyness and not present to what we are doing. We miss seeing Jesus. Abraham almost missed seeing the angels that were right in front of him because of his over-the-top hospitality. Martha was missing Jesus who was right in the next room because she was over-serving. Jesus is reminding us that we need both contemplation and action. But that we just must stay focused on him. Otherwise, we just get caught up in the busyness for the sake of being busy, distracted by everything around us. And we're no longer conscious of the hospitality that we're doing. And as a result, we miss seeing the needs around us. So did Martha run out of the kitchen? I don't think so. I think Jesus put his arm around her and said, Martha, this has been awesome. I have never tasted such delicious food. Next time, though, just do one dish. Come. Come and sit with us a while. 
Thanks be to God. Well, as is our tradition here at Mitchell's, let us affirm together what we believe with the saying of our Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. Thank you again so much for continuing to send in your tithes and offerings to the church office. And for those that we've received this week, let us now pray our prayer of dedication. God, we give today in thankfulness and with the assurance that anything we give will contribute to the continuing growth of your kingdom in the world. Give us wisdom as a church so that this offering is used for the sharing of your word and the service of your people. In the name of the one that gave us everything we have and everything that we are. Amen. Well, as we mentioned earlier, the psalmist has told us, be still and know that I am God. So as we come to this time of prayer, I just would invite you to let the worries of the day just kind of float off right now. And just just breathe and calm our minds and open our busy hearts to be in God's presence as we go now in prayer. Let us pray. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. But what's distracting you today? What's keeping you from being able to focus on what's right in front of you right now? What are the distractions that might be keeping you from seeing Christ? Things to ponder on today. Again, I would encourage you as a person of Mitchell's, if you have not done your survey, to please get that turned in. That information is so helpful to the community. Thank you. You all are amazing. Continue to keep in touch with each other. Continue to reach out. It's so, so important. And know that you all are so special and so loved. Receive your virtual hug today. And receive this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. God's shalom today and every day. Amen.